As of the recording of this Roland Rambles video, I have some throat irritation and will be probably coughing frequently. If the coughing bothers you, switch to another video because this isn't for you. If you can get over the fact that I'll occasionally go <coughs> and make some horrible noise in the side here, then we can continue. I'm going to discuss why I would not select a free software or open source license for my operating system and programs that I keep talking about in other previous videos. I want to make a new operating system and new programs like browsers, graphical user interface, and so on, but I want to do it so that there are a lot of the problems with the existing systems that just don't need to carry over into this new creation. And one of the biggest problems with open source software, and uh, more particularly um, with Linux and anything really revolving around X Windows system stuff or Wayland or whatever specifically, <clears throat> one of the biggest problems I've seen is that the open source software ecosystem has a real bad habit of being a bit of a monoculture of distraction. If you have an open source system such as Linux or any of the BSDs, there is a very good chance you're running Xorg or X11, whatever you want to call it. You might be running Wayland, but the bottom line is that that's really just trying to swap out X11 for something that's supposed to be better. <clears throat> a lot of stuff doesn't support it or work on it right yet, and a lot of stuff probably never will uh, because so much was written for Xorg or X11 that it's just probably not going to happen. So, <clears throat> as far as that goes, what I see when I look at the open source software ecosystem is there is a very low barrier to entry. Now granted, to write software, there is not a low barrier to entry. Any moron can co code something in Python that writes, hello world, asks you your name, and says hello name. It's pretty straightforward. But doing things like make files or making your software build on something other than the exact thing that you have, and it, it gets complicated. So there is not no barrier to entry, but the barrier to entry in terms of programmers is pretty low. It's easy to get into open source software development because nobody's gonna stop you. You can literally just go out there, you know, spin up a GitHub or Codeberg or whatever account somewhere, install Linux with all the compiler crap, you know, already there. You don't have to do very much to get to the point where you can write code and shove it up to a Git repository somewhere on the internet. Getting there is, if you are somewhat competent with computers, not very difficult. This is a good thing because it encourages programmers to learn how to program. It, it encourages people to try and to share with other people, which is the whole point of open source and specifically free software, free as in freedom, software. The whole point is to share with people. The whole point is that if people, if you write code and you share it with other people, they can look at your code, learn from it. They can look at your code and reuse portions or all of it in some other code. There's the, the principle of reusing instead of reinventing the wheel has largely served the open source free software community very well. The problem is that everything sort of starts to fall into a trench. You see, what I've noticed, and I mentioned File Explorer, and some people have told me that Dolphin for KDE um, is actually closer to being on par with Windows File Explorer than everything that comes with GNOME or Cinnamon or XFCE or whatever. And I haven't had a chance to really look at that, but that's just one facet of the things that I had that I took issue with. The most popular Linux distributions use GNOME as the desktop environment. If they don't use GNOME, they use a GNOME derivative like Cinnamon or Mate. And thus, they also use GNOME's file manager which you, you know, whatever it's called in your particular flavor, be it Nemo or Nautilus or whatever, they use the GNOME file manager as the file manager. <clears throat> and the GNOME file manager is not that great. 
there's a lot of white space. It, it just kind of sucks. And I, I'm not very interested in using it. <laughs> it. There's a lot of things it can't do that Windows File Explorer can do. But because of the amount of technical debt, and I am rehashing some ground here from previous videos, because of the, the amount of technical debt accumulated in existing desktop environments, it's not likely that GNOME is going to be replaced or replacing their file management stuff anytime soon. It's not likely they're going to fix it anytime soon. And if KDE offers a better solution, great. But that's not what most Linux distributions come with out of the box. Um, there are undoubtedly more Linux programs running GTK as the toolkit, the you know the the GNOME you know toolkit whatever. Um, then there are Qt, which is the library behind KDE and which is used in Telegram and some other software. But there's no doubt that GTK software is way more common than Qt software. So we have this problem where there's this huge software base that's built up. There are these huge software projects that create entire desktop environments built up. But despite KDE supposedly being better, and I would argue, yes, there are a lot of ways that KDE could be looked at, and hey, that's better. That's better than GNOME in this way, in this way, in this way. A lot of distributions are stuck on GNOME, but also <clears throat> a lot of distributions um, have KDE or XFCE or Fluxbox or uh, IceWM or FLWM, whatever. And while all this choice is a good thing in general, there it's sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. But if I go back to Windows and Windows Explorer, it's a master of one, and that one is file management. You know, there is a lot of validity to the notion that, you know, only having one defined standard way of doing something makes it so that, okay, it's not as flexible. You can't infinitely do anything you want because, like, you can't, like, write a whole replacement for, say, you know, Windows Explorer. You can't just replace the entire shell, although, yes, I know people have done it. Don't tell me in the comments. I know there are replacements and things like that out there. But in general, <clears throat> um, programs expect that you are using Windows File Explorer as your shell, and that's it. Whereas on Linux, there is no such guarantee. The great weakness of Windows is that there's only one way to do things. And that's you go that way or the highway. The great weakness of Linux is that there are too many ways to do things. And supporting every way or even just two different ways tends to be a nightmare. So if I made an operating system, one of the things that I would want to do is keep people from writing software for it. Now that sounds insane. Why would you do this? Why would you write an operating system where you explicitly didn't want people to write software? Let me explain. It's not that I don't want anyone to write any software. It's not that I don't want third-party software. It's not that I don't want to be able to expand beyond what I decide should be coded. But <clears throat> building an operating system is no small feat. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of manpower, and if I was going to go to all the trouble of rebuild or building a whole system from scratch, you know, probably employing teams of people to do it, I would want that system to be right. I would want that system to learn from mistakes made in the past 30 years because there has not been a remotely mainstream new operating system created since Linux in 1991. It is 2024 as of this recording. In case you're having trouble doing the math, that's 33 years. 33 years that we haven't had a new operating system that has actually clawed even 0.1% of OS market share. Haiku, that's cute. Oh, Serenity OS, oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's nice. Menuet OS, Temple OS, well, none of this stuff is remotely mainstream. This stuff is extreme niche hobbyist. Arguably, if, if your goal is to have something neat to look at, 
and then stop using because of the limitations or because, you know, the software base isn't there, <clears throat> the maturity isn't there or whatever. If that's what you're going for, then those things are a success. But if what you're going for is an operating system that is actually, like, usable, like, reasonably properly refined and mature and with all the basic software available that you would expect, you know, web browser, word processor, text editor, uh, image editing facility. If you want all that, mm, you know, they might have that, but none of them have ever managed to really make any inroads. Um, in general, none of these things have... Um, they have not really succeeded in terms of actually being used by a significant number of people. And you can ask yourself, why haven't they succeeded? And there's a million different reasons. One of them, I think, is hardware compatibility is a major issue with most operating systems. In fact, I know for a fact that um, one OS I had my finger on the pulse of a little bit for a while there was called Ununium, U-N-U-N-U-N-I-U-M. Uh, I think it's named after one of those heavy metal elements in the periodic table. And Ununium seemed very interesting to me. They, they had some interesting things to say on their website and um, their philosophy and all that. <clears throat> but eventually they gave up. And I, I hope it's this one that I'm thinking of. Eventually they gave up, posted on their website, they were stopping development, and the reason that they gave was it's too difficult to keep up with all the hardware that's coming out. It's too difficult to, to keep pace with hardware changes. So they gave up. Even today on Linux, the most well-supported operating system outside of Windows and Mac OS, even on Linux today, there are things that don't work at all. There are things that work with a lot of caveats or that are crippled. I have a brand new laptop, an Asus VivoBook 16 M1605. It has a particular MediaTek Wi-Fi card that has no Linux driver at all. None exists. No one has made one. No hobbyist has made one. MediaTek hasn't made one. Nobody. <clears throat> the solution to this problem that is offered up by all the nerds on the internet is buy a new Wi-Fi card, open your computer, remove the Wi-Fi card, install the new Wi-Fi card, close up your computer. That's how you solve the problem. That's not really an acceptable solution to some guy who just goes out and buys a computer and wants to adopt your operating system. That's just not going to work. You can't do that. Users won't do that. So hardware support's a big one, but hardware support is not really affected by what I'm talking about. And hardware support is something that I would be willing to allow people to code drivers for. Absolutely, all day long. You got hardware, you want it supported, feel free to write the drivers for it all day long. Totally fine by me. I have no problem with that. <clears throat> However, what I would not want people to do is write a file manager, a web browser. But how can you do this? You can't stop people from writing software. And you're right. I can't. I can't stop people from writing software. But what I can do is put in the license of my operating system that you're not allowed to write any piece of software that the operating system already has officially available or any of these categories that it plans to. Or I would rather in the beginning just be like, well, you can't write any software for this system yet. It's not ready for that. Because what will happen is you'll be doing you know, early alpha development on the, on the operating system, release it, let people see it. <clears throat> Immediately, people will start writing software or porting software over to it. One of my greatest fears is that I'd write an operating system and somebody would write a MinGW, SigWin, you know, that style of compatibility layer 
that will make my intentionally not POSIX compatible. I do not want to be compatible with Linux or BSD or whatever. Intentionally not POSIX compatible system. If someone writes a POSIX compatibility layer for it, what will happen is people will go grab all of the crap that every other open source system has. Now that there's a compatibility layer, oh, let's just use this to build the same crap that we have everywhere else for this new system whose entire purpose is to break with that tradition and improve upon it exponentially by abandoning all of the broken crap that I'm now building on top of this compatibility layer. I would explicitly want to make it so that no one was allowed to make software for the system until I had a system put together that was working well enough. And that's the main reason. I don't want the source code to be available to someone and then have them write some piece of crap or port some piece of crap from the broken old ways of doing things and that piece of crap becomes a standard, even if it's a de facto standard that I say, no, that's not part of the system. People will flock to it because guess what? They already know how to use a Linux command prompt. Fuck it. Let's use that. <clears throat> so my biggest worry is that I write an operating system and it basically just becomes Linux but worse. What's the point? We need a radical break from everything that exists. We do not need a system that just, you know, oh, well, we're going to do things a little differently. Maybe, maybe it's got some performance benefits that would justify switching over to it. You know, maybe some hardcore server nerds or whatever, you know, or maybe somebody with really old computers will use it because it's really light on resources. No, I don't want that, though. I don't want people to take that and then slap Oh, here's all the GNU core utilities and the GNU C library and all this crap. Uh, let's just stack it all on top of this. And oh, now it's Linux. It's basic. It's it's not Linux, but everything looks and feels like Linux. And oh, now we're familiar with it. Now it's the same crap that it's always been. That familiarity, I understand. You know, having a shallower learning curve, being able to reuse existing knowledge. I understand and see the value in that, but the whole point of a new system is not to take advantage of existing knowledge, it's to make it so that you do things a better way that breaks with that existing knowledge. Let's, um, let's take, well, let's talk about the Unix philosophy in general, and in specific, I'm thinking of commands like ls or find or rm, that you would use at the command prompt. <clears throat> Find is a, a particularly interesting one. I make liberal use of it. But the find command is, um, well, it, it's kind of shitty, actually. I, I don't like find. I don't like find. I don't like exargs. I don't like any of that. Um, I kind of really hate the way that some of this stuff is put together because a lot of people are taught, you know, use the find command to find files or folders or whatever, you know, by name or by size or by type, and then use print zero to print the names with nulls in between them instead of new lines, and then pass it to exargs and have exargs run rm whatever to delete them. Or you can just, you know, find dash name whatever dash delete and it'll delete them for you. For these simple use cases, it's actually pretty fine. But just as an example, if I do the find command and I wanna find a file by size and I'm looking for a specific size, how do I do that? See, the problem with size is that size is not expressed in terms of bytes. It's expressed in terms of blocks. And that doesn't change unless you use a particular suffix to change the behavior. How big is a block? I don't friggin' know. It depends. Now, okay, usually it's 1K. Well, busybox find can be configured to be different ones. The find command, there's all this stuff in it that's really cryptic. The help is unhelpful. Just, it, it, if you put find, um, 
dash max depth two so that it doesn't search directory recursion further than two levels down. And then you type dash type F, okay? You're looking for files with a maximum recursion depth of two levels. Find will scold you saying that max depth two is supposed to be before um, any kind of, or no, I'm, I'm sorry, I have it backwards. It's like you put find type F max depth two. It'll say, oh, max, max depth is supposed to be before you put what you're looking for in a file. Uh, it's supposed to be before, not after. Well, 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 fuck you. You know what I meant. You know what I meant. The error message, the error message you've given me indicates that you know what I'm trying to do. And you're telling me because I didn't put it in in a specific order that, that, oh, well, I'll do it, but I won't do it. But, you know, it's just like, why? Why are you doing this? Why do I have to type this in in this stupid certain order? But there's some of this stuff that is standardized. You know, some of this behavior standardized in POSIX or single unit specification or whatever. You know, there, there's all these standards that standardize old, compatible, bad behavior. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to create a system where we keep stupid, brain-dead behavior like that. I don't want to keep a system where if we know, for example, the length of a string, we can't pass it along. In fact, the whole string length thing has sort of become like my holy war, if you will. Take um, the command line, for example. If you type a command, <clears throat> and it splits the command line up based on, you know, items that have spaces in between them. Like, that's how it parses the arguments. Well, why can't it, if it's doing that, why can't it slice up these arguments and send the length of everything to the program in question? You know, if you're typing out a command line, if it's being fed a command line, and it does the work of splitting it anywhere... Why can't the individual lengths be attached? Like, one of the big things that I would love to have in C is for every string to be prefixed with a string length. Every string should have its length at the beginning of the string somewhere, so in some way, so that you're able to not run these stupid length checks everywhere to try and figure out how long the damn thing is. So you don't have to compare every character in a string against the number zero to see if the string is done and over with. But that, that's just one facet that I keep hammering, but it, it's a prime example of an old design decision that doesn't make sense today. There are so many ways that you could optimize things, and just and I get it. Like back in the day, systems were extremely limited. So you would want to give a C programmer absolute free reign to do all kinds of fun stuff. So I would want to lock down the source. I would not want to give the source code away at first because I don't think that people could be trusted with it. I think that it is likely people would code stuff in anticipation of being able to release it. And I don't want people to release it. I don't want people to write software for the system because I want to set the standard for what a file explorer type program would be, for what the core system utilities would be. I do not want the POSIX stuff. I don't care. <clears throat> I don't care that you want to be able to use your old shell scripts and your old Unix knowledge with my brand new system. The whole point of the new system is to do a better job. Yes, you will be forced to learn new ways to do things. But you won't have to type cryptic commands. It won't be crappy like PowerShell either. You know, it, there will be better ways to get the things done. They will work faster. They will be able to work potentially in parallel, since parallel processing is basically available in everything at this point. You know, except for extremely limited 10-year-old machines or more. You know, parallel processing is everywhere, but a lot of things don't take advantage of it because your bone stock procedural programming is pretty specifically designed to work sequentially. That's the blueprint for C programming. It's designed to do thing, then do other thing, then if this thing, do this thing. Otherwise, 
do that thing. You know, it, it's step by step by step, and there's room for improvement in a lot of ways. Now, granted, if it's written in C, it'll still have to sidestep the whole parallel issue somehow. <clears throat> I have some ideas for that. I actually want to develop a domain-specific language for things like file management or j just general data management stuff that takes larger commands, uh, like, for example, um, hash this file with this hash function, and it just does it. And you don't have to feed a hash function in. You don't have to you know, do anything other than just say, you know, read this file and hash the contents and, you know, store it in the, you know, with, and you can say do it for each file in this list. And then the language can take that do it for each in the list and go, oh, this might be something we can parallelize. And if it's a medium like solid state drives that have a lot of parallel execution capability, you know, several flash chips or whatever, then you can have it reading eight files at once on your eight processor machine and running eight hashes at the same time. <clears throat> you know, that's totally possible. And right now, you know, like JDupes, my duplicate scanner, it does everything sequentially on a single processor because parallel processing's a bitch. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a generic system that allowed you to do parallel processing by telling the system you wanted to do this for a bunch of things and it would just do it on a bunch of things at the same time at whatever distribution your system was capable of handling. You know, whatever seems to be optimal for your CPU cores count and your, your media, whatever. If it's rotational, maybe we don't do eight reads at a time since the heads will scatter everywhere. But yeah, you know, there's... If there's one thing that kind of holds a lot of systems back from taking advantage of multiprocessing, it's that everything is generally designed to work on a uniprocessor system. I probably should just bottom line this and get out. I want to make a new system. I want that new system to have a lot of standards. Standards that improve upon everything we've learned about computers, operating systems, all of it, over the past 40 or 50 years of computing evolution. I want those standards to be reflected in the software. I want the software to adhere tightly to those standards, and I don't want other people to show up and drag in old stuff, thereby violating those standards. I don't want other people to be able to create an alternative to my system that doesn't go along with those new standards that, you know, oh, well, you know, this way is is slower or crappy or whatever, but it has this one feature, and then people go to it because, oh, well, hey, I happen to need that one feature. And they, you know, just, just somebody can make something glitzy and garbage while I'm making something that's ugly, but that is very, very technically sophisticated and refined and, you know, basically just needs the pretty slapped on top of it later. You know, if I do the grunt work, but then they come along and make glitzy McShit Explorer that doesn't do a good job of being an actual file browser. But, oh, it looks pretty, so we're going to go ahead and uh, people are going to adopt that because, wow, look how much, look how nice it is. It makes this system look so cool. Well, I don't want my system to look cool. I want it to be technically correct first. Form over function is the biggest problem in both computing and society today. Everything's about how you look doing it. Everything is an Instagram post. Everything is a tweet that's nice and snarky underneath Donald Trump's name so that you can get some, some sort of social clout for being the reply girl underneath the, you know, whatever, the controversial guy that everybody hates, you know? That's it. it everything is, a, is about the, the appearance of being good. It's not about actually being good. And if you allow people to create stuff that looks good and runs like dog shit, and it gets adopted as a de facto standard by other people, what's going to happen is that no matter what you do, the pretty dog shit is always, the gilded turd is always going to win out. 
unless it's just that bad at the core. All it has to do is be good enough that people see it's a pretty shiny, ooh, wow, I'm a fucking magpie and here's a pile of coins. And it doesn't fuck up all the time. I can get most of my work done with it and they'll adopt it. Because the truth is, normies are stupid. People in general are morons. They see something that looks beautiful and they think that makes it good. And it doesn't. If you need any proof, there's this guy on YouTube. His handle on YouTube is Better Bachelor. And all he does is rip on women that run around going, I, I'm sexy, I'm hot. Woohoo, why won't these guys do it? And that'll give you an idea. A lot of really entitled people, because there's so many thirsty men out there that'll simp for them, a lot of really entitled ladies that think that they deserve a kingdom of their own, that they are the queen, the main character in, this, in everyone's life. They are the main character. And where does it come from? It comes from, oh, look at me, I'm pretty. You know, I know because other people have decided so. Other people have treated me like I'm pretty and made me popular. That's why the popular people, they, they tend to be the pretty people, and pretty people tend to be shitty people because they don't have to develop any actual value outside of the glitz. I do not want to make a pretty system at first. I want to make a good system. I want to make that system that if we are going to keep with the entitled female analogy, is more like that, uh, that girl that was down in Louisiana or Alabama or somewhere in the deep south that was looking like trying to catch catfish with her arm. And I think they call that noodling. And all these, uh, all these women got mad because, oh, how could, you, how could you date a woman like this? And it was the plasticine alloy, like, you know, did you, like, like artificial cyborg looking makeup cake lady that was mad about it. It was like, I'm the pretty one. How could, how could any man, any man who tries to date this woman is gay? Well, I don't want my operating system to be treated in that way. I want it to be ugly until it's ready to shine. But more importantly, I don't want anybody to use it until it's ready to be used. And that's kind of where I'm going with this all. Anyway, I think I'm going to leave it there. I would love to hear what you think. Leave a comment below. I don't care how mean it is. In fact, if you want to be really mean, everybody go down there and comment, fart, fart, fart. As a tribute to Matthew Garrett, the loser who thought he could fork the Linux kernel because it wasn't socially justice enough. I think that would be really funny, because that's what he would do to anybody who disagreed with him in his comment section. He'd edit their comment and replace it with fart, fart, fart. So, go down below and fart in my comments. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the drill. Take care. Have a good one. And that BMW is about to get in serious shit. Because, yeah. Calm down, big boy. Well, it looks like this has become another episode of Road Rage Rambles. All right, let's wait until these psychos are gone. We can wait. You can you can stop listening to me talk about officers. I'm about to honk. I'm about to honk nice and loud. I see ya, PKZ7606. Clam down. This episode of Speed and Rambles was not brought to you by Monster Energy because I'm trying not to drink that stuff anymore. So anyway, now that the uh, psychotic Apex drivers in North Carolina have been uh, allowed to proceed and now they're going 
58 miles an hour because there's traffic, <clears throat> we can proceed with our discussion. And then they make it parallel later by like, oh, we'll, we'll make some kernel threads and um, each of those... Well, that guy was a fucking idiot. Hey, if you happen to see the license plate on that guy's car, you know, call the Apex police and let them know. That'd be pretty cool, right? Thanks. Yeah, so anyway, that could have been a lot worse. So I think 